All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, all of our jurors are here and ready to go. Um, I want to explain uh, our protocols and why space in the courtroom is so limited uh, due to the COVID virus. Uh, the Supreme Court has asked that all local courts follow certain guidelines, including social distancing and masks. And that's why everybody has to wear a mask. Once the trial begins with testimony, we're going to move the plexiglass to the witness stand and I'll put my mask on and that'll allow the jurors to take their mask off if they're behind here. Um, here's the thing, folks. I'm trying a double homicide case. I cannot worry about social distancing. So. You're all adults. Y'all know who lives in the same households and who's hanging out together. I can't focus on that. I just ask that you honor the Tennessee Supreme Court wishes, which are also my orders now as well, too. Uh, and so we're making as much space as we can for the public. Um, there has been some concern about public access and limited space in the courtroom. Um, I think that's being accomplished through through media coverage. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about the uh, the the protocols, just make sure you're following those. I can't really focus on policing them. And so, General Sanchez, if you'd please publish the indictment. State of Tennessee County of Knox, criminal court for Knox County, Tennessee. The grand jurors for the state of Tennessee upon their oaths present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore to wit, on or about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid, did unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation, killed Joel Guy Sr in violation of TCA 3913202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Second count, and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid did unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation uh, kill Lisa Guy in violation of TCA 3913202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Third count, the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on or about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid, did unlawfully kill Lisa Guy during the perpetration of first degree murder in violation of TCA 3913202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Fourth count, and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on or about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid, did unlawfully kill Joel Guy Sr. during the perpetration of theft in violation of TCA 39-13202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Fifth count. In the grand jurors aforesaid, upon their oaths aforesaid, do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on or about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid, did unlawfully kill Lisa Guy during the perpetration of theft in violation of TCA 3913-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Six count, the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid, did unlawfully, knowingly, and without legal privilege, physically mistreat the corpse of Joel Guy Sr. in a manner offensive to the sensibilities of an ordinary person in violation of TCA 3917-312 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Seventh count, and the grand jurors aforesaid upon their oaths aforesaid do further present that Joel Michael Guy, heretofore, to wit, on about the blank day of November 2016, in the state and county aforesaid did unlawfully, knowingly, and without legal privilege physically mistreat the corpse of Lisa Guy in a manner offensive to the sensibilities of an ordinary person in violation of TCA 3917-312 and against peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee, uh, signed Sean P. Allen, District Attorney General. Mr. Halstead, how does Mr. Guy plead to these allegations? Not guilty. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, you're excused. Thank you so much. I will see you tomorrow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is, is the rural sequestration of witnesses requested. Yes. All right, if there are any witnesses uh, involved in this case in the courtroom, uh, Mr. McCord, your designated um, uh, Represent a detective. You may remain in the courtroom. Any other witnesses, you must be excused at this point. You may not discuss your testimony with any other witnesses. Oh, and, and family members as well, too. So nobody should talk about any testimony that you hear during the course of this trial. Uh, and also, I would uh, instruct you, you cannot uh, watch any live streaming. If there's any live streaming from media on this, those witnesses are prohibited from doing that as well, too. 
All right, it is time for opening statements. Joan, may I begin your opening statement? Would like to clarify that the families There are any family members remaining who... Article Victim Victims Rights Act. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> All right, Johnny, you may begin your opening statement whenever you're ready. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time and attention this week. I want to thank you in advance. We expect to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that on November the 26th of 2016, Joel Michael Guy Sr. was viciously attacked in his home in the exercise room that he had upstairs. During this assault, he sustained 42 sharp force injuries. You're gonna hear proof from the medical examiner and from a forensic anthropologist about these injuries. And what you're going to hear is that these injuries were so severe that uh, marks were left on his ribs, 12 of his ribs, uh, marks ranging from scratches to complete severing. The medical examiner is going to tell you that the cause of his death was multiple sharp force injuries that caused damage to his lungs, to his liver, and to his kidneys. He sustained a wound to his scapula, which is where your shoulder is, and it was such a severe wound that a fragment from a blunt force instrument was left in the muscular tissue uh, next, to, next to the bone. He sustained abdominal wounds. So he was attacked from the front as well as the back. You're gonna hear testimony that most of the stab blood staining evidence in this exercise room that indicated that there was a fierce, fierce struggle. In one corner of the room, there is blood evidence to show that there was thrashing motion. Um, and uh, it left not only blood marks, but white marks and uh, droplets on two walls of the room and extensive blood staining on the carpet. You will hear that he sustained defensive injuries on both of his hands, which indicate that he was fighting and he fought for his life. And his hands were sliced. And you're going to see photographs and hear testimony about the nature and the extent of these injuries. After he was murdered, the killer disrobed him, meticulously took off his clothes, his shoes, his pants, his shirt and jacket, left them in a heap uh, on the carpet. He left uh, Jill Sr.'s cigarettes on top of the pile. And they were blood stained. He left his hands in the room. At some point, Lisa Guy came home and she too was subjected to a violent assault. And you're gonna hear testimony and see proof of her injuries. She was stabbed 31 times and she sustained serious uh, uh, injuries to her ribs. She uh, had 21 rib injuries, 21. Nine of her ribs were severed and uh, you will hear a forensic anthropologist talk to you about the, uh, the variation of the injuries to her ribs, indicating uh, not just slice marks, scratches, severing, uh, but also evidence that uh, the sharp instrument used to stab her twisted into the cartilage of her ribs. She had one rib that was fractured from blunt force trauma, not sharp force but blunt force indicating that she was, that there was pressure applied to her ribs. And you will hear that most of these injuries occurred to her back. She had one injury to her clavicle and uh, 
a stab wound, and she had several stab wounds to her buttock. You will hear testimony that uh, there was evidence in the upper hall at the top of the stairwell from the bottom floor to the top floor that indicates that this is where her murder took place. Blood staining on the walls, drip marks, uh, marks that indicate uh, a spray, perhaps. And like Joel Sr., her clothes were removed from her. They were cut off and left in a bloody pile on top of a large blood stain on the carpet. You will hear that the scissors were found there along with a knife. You will hear that there were also two knives left in the exercise room. So at some point um, after Joel Sr. and Lisa were murdered, the killer uh, went to work on their bodies. Joel Sr.'s arms, both of them, were severed at the joint, the shoulder blade. Both of his legs were removed at the hip. His right foot was removed at the ankle. And as you know, his hands, of course, were also removed at the wrist. Lisa had both of her arms removed from her torso at the shoulder. Both of her legs were cut off below the knee. Her right hand was severed from her arm and the killer cut off her head. You will hear testimony from a forensic anthropologist who will tell you that uh, her head was uh, basically broken from a part of the spine called the, the atlas. There was a blunt force trauma uh, applied to her neck before her head was severed uh, from, her, from her spine. After the limbs of these people were removed, the killer placed them separately into two 45-gallon blue Sterlite containers. You will hear testimony and see evidence of uh, where that took place. And you will learn that in the master bedroom of their home, uh, plastic sheeting was placed on the floor. And these blue plastic bins were placed on the sheeting. The killer put Lisa's body parts in one, and he put Jill Sr.'s in the other. And then he covered them with a corrosive substance and left them there to liquefy into uh, some sort of diabolical stew of human remains. And then the killer took Lisa's head and carried it downstairs and took it into the kitchen. He got out a stock pot placed her head in the pot, filled it with liquid, carried it over to the stove, covered it, turned on the stove, and left it there to cook. So, you will hear some proof from family members about this family. And you're gonna hear, this photograph was taken on the Thanksgiving day just before their murders, November the 24th. The photograph is taken by uh, Michelle Dennison, Joel Sr.'s daughter. And you're gonna hear a little bit about this family. You're gonna hear that Joel and Lisa were very happily married. They loved each other. They had been married for 31 years. And the defendant was their only child. But Joel Sr. had been married before, years before, 
and he had three daughters, Chandis and twins, Michelle and Angela. And you're going to hear from each of them um, a little bit about their family. And you're going to hear that uh, you know, they communicated regularly, and uh, they, uh, they had a great relationship with their dad and with Lisa, whom they were very fond of. Lisa had treated them like they were her own. You're going to hear a little bit about the dynamics of this family, and you're going to hear that uh, on Thanksgiving, uh, you know, Joel and Lisa had, uh, had arranged to have a family get-together. And uh, Michelle and her boyfriend and her three young sons, who are depicted in this photograph, came to spend the day, all that Thursday, came to spend the day with, uh, with Lisa and Joel. Uh, Angela and Chandice weren't able to come. Uh, so it was just, uh, just these people, along with the defendant, who came up from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he lived. He drove up the day before, November the 23rd. You're going to hear that this was going to be, and I'm not being smart aleck, I'm not, when I say it, it was going to be their last Thanksgiving in this home that they had on Golden View Lane in Knox County um, because they were moving. Joel and Lisa had plans. Joel had worked as a contractor. Uh, he designed piping systems. Uh, Lisa had a job with Jacobs Engineering. She was a disbursement specialist. And they were, uh, they were, uh, they were done with work. Lisa had turned in her notice. Uh, Joel's contract was concluded, and they had decided to retire for a while, and they were moving. Their house was for sale. They had a contract on it, and uh, Joel was going to buy his family home in Sir Goinsville, Tennessee, in Upper East Tennessee, near, near Kingsport. And he had made arrangements with his sister, Robin White, to purchase the home, and uh, this was going to be the last Thanksgiving that the family was going to spend in Knoxville. Um, their next holiday plans were going to be for uh, Christmas in Sir Goinsville. They were ready, uh, you know, to move on and to enjoy what was left of their lives. So, I want to give you an idea of kind of a timeline for uh, or where we are this, this weekend. And you're going to see that uh, the defendant came to Knoxville from Baton Rouge on November the 23rd. The family get-together uh, was on Thanksgiving the 24th. You will hear proof that on November the 25th, Joel and Lisa and uh, the defendant drove up to Sir Goinsville to uh, deliver a boat that uh, that Joel Sr. had, and he wanted to take it to the Sir Goinsville house. You will see and hear evidence that uh, Lisa was alive on November the 26th, you know, sometime after noon. We know that because of evidence we have from a shopping trip that she made in Knoxville. And we know that the defendant was in Knoxville on November the 26th, also because of evidence we have from a receipt where he went shopping uh, at a store, uh, a Walmart store, and was seen there around 3.35. Uh, the evidence will show that Joel and Lisa were murdered on Saturday, November the 26th. You will hear proof that the defendant left Knoxville at some point on November the 27th, and you will hear proof that the guy's bodies were found on Monday, November the 28th. So, how did that happen? Jennifer Whited is uh, a supervisor at Jacob Engineering. She worked uh, with Lisa. They were work friends. Um, they had a good relationship. And uh, she's going to tell you that uh, the week after Thanksgiving was going to be Lisa's last week of work. She was due to, uh, I'm sorry I keep doing this, but I, I cannot. I'm having a hard time uh, uh, speaking. 
she was going to have her last day on Friday uh, of that week, and uh, she didn't show up for work on Monday. Now, this was very unusual. Jennifer's going to tell you that Lisa was quite dependable, and, uh, and Jennifer was worried about why she didn't show up and why she didn't call, why she didn't text. She, uh, she became concerned because she started to call her. Some women at work had planned to take Lisa out for lunch that day, kind of a going away luncheon. And this was highly unusual behavior. So Jennifer calls and texts multiple times and uh, with no response. And uh, she became so concerned and had such a weird feeling about it that she called uh, 911 and asked them uh, to send officers out to perform what we call a welfare check. And you're going to have evidence, hear evidence that an officer, Stephen Ballard, did go by the house on Golden View Lane in Knox County, and uh, he went to check things out. He will tell you that you know, he saw cars in the driveway, um, really didn't see any signs of disturbance. He didn't look that closely, uh, knocked on the door, I think, nobody answered, and then he left. But Jennifer wasn't satisfied, and she persisted, and she, uh, she asked the uh, sheriff's department, because this was in the county, to, uh, to check again. So Detective Jeremy McCord um, made, uh, made a trip over there, and he made uh, a number of observations while he was there. He, too, noted that there were three vehicles in the driveway, uh, two cars and a truck. He noted the for sale sign in the front yard, and uh, he thought that was kind of significant because he had been looking at houses himself, and he noticed on the front door that there wasn't a realtor lockbox. Typically, you know, that, that can happen when that will be present when a house is for sale. He went to the front door and knocked and didn't receive an answer. He knocked hard, identified himself as a member of the sheriff's department, wanted, you know, to let whoever was inside know that they, he was there to check on their welfare. And when he was at the front door, if you will notice these, uh, he was able to look in and see through the windows that there were uh, groceries that were scattered uh, in the floor of the foyer area. And uh, he, he, that concerned him. There were a number of bags uh, left in the floor. So, uh, no one responded to the knocks, and he decided to go around back. And when he went around back, he observed that the doorknob from the back door was missing. It's completely gone. And he thought, well, that's strange because the doorknob on the front door had looked sort of weird to him. It didn't look like it fit properly in the front door. There were scratch marks around it. And so he made the conclusion that for some reason the doorknob from the back door had been removed and placed on the front door. And he just felt like something was wrong. He heard a dog barking inside. And um, he just kind of became alarmed and he felt like there was a need for, uh, for officers to, uh, to go inside. He even called the realtor to try to figure out, you know, what was going, you know, what was going on. Those were their cars. Uh, the realtor suggested uh, maybe looking inside one of the cars to see if there was a garage door opener that could open the garage door so he could get in. And he made the decision to go in. In law enforcement, this is kind of called exigent circumstances, and it means that there is a fear of an emergency situation that requires police to enter into a residence. And it, we'll hear from Detective McCord, it's not that unusual. Law enforcement officers all over the country every day respond to welfare check requests. And they, are, you know, they, they find injured people, they find people who are sick, and sometimes they find people who are deceased. And, uh, and so he was worried and decided that you know, he needed to check on their welfare, and uh, so he went in. And when he did so, uh, Immediately, upon opening the garage door, um, 
he felt more of what he had felt when he was at the back door. When he was at the back door and looked through the, the hole that was left from the doorknob, he had felt heat and had detected kind of an odor uh, that uh, concerned him. But when he opened the garage door, there was a blast of heat and an overpowering smell, something strange, something that he had not smelled before. And so being alarmed at the unusual nature of this situation, um, you know, he decided to go in with some trepidation. He was careful. And the way law enforcement officers go into a house under these circumstances, because there may be danger there, who knows what they might encounter, they go from room to room. They announce themselves as law enforcement officers, and uh, they move through the house in what is called a clear. They're clearing it. And he will tell you that they entered through the garage into the kitchen area, and he's going to describe for you the things that he found inside the house that were very unusual to him. I mean, other than the heat, which he will tell you was, uh, when they looked at the thermostat, the temperatures were in the high 90s, okay? I'm not talking about a warm house. I'm talking about a hot, hot house. And I'm talking about an odor that uh, caused officers to uh, have physical reactions to. Um, in the kitchen of the house, he saw things scattered on the floor. And uh, he noticed... Uh, towels and bottles of bleach and a bottle of muriatic acid and uh, garbage bags. He noticed that the stove was operating and there was a pot on it. He noticed that the oven was on. Uh, he noticed that there was a cell phone on the counter and on the kitchen table there were two wallets that were out, you know, that one looked like it belonged to a female. There was a picture, an ID of a woman on it. The other uh, was brown, looked more masculine. Uh, a ball-peen hammer and a vice grip. A lady's purse on the table. Um, it looked unusual to him. He kept announcing law enforcement. And he moved through the house. He went into the dining room. Um, and there he saw weapons on the dining room table, boxes of ammunition in the floor. Um, there were tools also on the dining room table, a screwdriver and what appeared to be a lock set, another doorknob lock set. In the foyer, there were uh, multiple bags from a Walmart in, that had groceries inside them, including perishables, things like ice cream bacon and sausage, the sort of things that one would, uh, uh, you would expect that you would put away in the refrigerator as soon as you came home. Uh, some boxes of beer. And as he went through the house in the downstairs, he just became uh, more and more anxious. There was a little study area, uh, a den, the den contained the door that had the missing doorknob. There was animal waste, feces on the carpet, and uh, urine stains. Uh, there was a heater that was plugged in and was operating at full blast. Um, and again, he noticed the thermostat set so high. He goes through the downstairs, and as he did so, he starts to feel fear. And... Uh, I mean, he'll tell you. He's not ashamed to tell you. It was scary. He began to go up the stairwell, and as he was going up the stairs, he noticed that there were blood drip marks on the walls, and there was uh, blood on the carpet. And, I mean, at this point, he will tell you he knew that something terrible was wrong. And at the top of the stairs, he sees this pile of clothing, this pile of bloody clothing and bloody scissors, and a bloody knife, and a big blood pool. And he looks down the hall, and he sees a pair of severed hands on the carpet in a room down the hall. And it freaked him out. His fear turned to horror 
as he continued to go through the upstairs, clearing the dogs barking on and off. He goes into the master bedroom and he sees in the floor a weird assorted jumble of articles that don't even appear to be used. There's a bag of clothes, there is a work light, there's a sledgehammer, there's a, like a portable heater that you can clamp on, it clamps on to a, a surface. There's a face mask that looks sort of like what you would, one would use to do painting, um, a more protective mask than the one that I'm wearing. Um, there's a blender and a box of latex gloves, a black garbage bag, a roll of plastic sheeting is on the, the bed, which is made, well, it was made and tidy. And uh, beanie babies, pile of beanie babies on the carpet next to all of this. Um, and other articles, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm remembering all of them. Um, bottles of food grade hydrogen peroxide, like jugs, big jugs. A jug of liquid fire, which is uh, the drain opener. Uh, back in the hall, next to Lisa's clothing, there were three empty big gallon, five gallon, I'm not sure how many gallon tubs of something called sewer line cleaner number two, and a bottle of, an empty bottle of Robic uh, drain opening solution. Um, that was in the hall. So back to the master bedroom, all of these weird, unusual products are here. And the master bath door is open. And of course, he can see what I described to you just a few minutes ago. Um, and it's something he will tell you that he never expected to see and he can't unsee it. The floor of the master bath coated in plastic, the same plastic sheeting cut from the sheeting that was uh, left on the bed, um, a garden hose connected to the shower head, a heater running full blast, a knife in the sink, and the remains of uh, what appeared to be human beings. At the time, Detective McCord will tell you he didn't know how many, who they were. Uh, he didn't know what he was dealing with. And they continued to clear the house. And in nearly every room in the house, they find evidence. Um, I think there was one room that was used for storage that uh, there was packing people, you could tell that the homeowners were packing, things were boxed up. I, I don't think they recovered anything out of that room, but there's a guest bedroom that they went into. And in that room, uh, on the bed, the unmade bed, there was a laptop computer that was plugged in, uh, a, a used latex glove on the, on the carpet. There was a backpack in a corner. Um, there was a bloody jug of the same food grade hydrogen peroxide on uh, the dresser, along with a box of latex gloves, some credit cards that appeared to be issued to Joel Sr. Um, other articles, uh, blood staining, blood staining on the carpet and a blood stain on the sheet, I think. Um, there's a bathroom upstairs in the hall, sort of a guest uh, guest bathroom. Uh, but I forgot, I forgot something important in the, in the guest bedroom. There were two tote, blue tote lids that corresponded with the blue plastic bins that were in the master bathroom. These, the lids, two lids for these were found. One propped up next to a suitcase that had some rumpled clothing in it and uh, also one under the bed. So, uh, so the tote lids that corresponded to the tubs in the master bath were in the guest bedroom. Along with a note that was in the suitcase uh, that mentioned uh, a store, uh, had the address of a, of a, of a business in Louisiana, uh, I love this name, Dan Boudreaux's Ace Hardware. 
in Napoleonville, Louisiana. So that note was in the suitcase in, in the uh, guest bedroom. So they move on to the guest bath and it is, uh, it's a mess. There are blood stains everywhere on the door, on the floor, on the sink and the counter. There's a pile of uh, clothes, like some shorts and a t-shirt and underwear that have some blood staining on them in the floor. Uh, used latex gloves scattered on the countertop, a knife on the counter, uh, bottles of rubbing alcohol, a couple of bottles of those, a couple of bottles of hydrogen peroxide, uh, some medical tape, looked like someone uh, had been had treated an injury there. Okay, Just blood staining everywhere and uh, some other first aid supplies. And also on the counter, there's a Walmart bag that uh, contains a receipt. And, uh, and that receipt depicts the products that were found in the room. And that receipt depicted a date, November the 26th, 2016. And uh, it depicted a time, 1535, 25, 3.35 p.m. And as if all of those discoveries weren't bad enough, go back downstairs um, after they've gotten rid of the dog that was locked up into a, in a laundry room in a stifling heat. Uh, they get someone to take care of the animal to get it out of the house and, and to, uh, uh, to be treated. Um, I don't know, animal Rescue, the Humane Society. For, he, he was animal control, I guess is what it's called. But they go back down to the kitchen and uh, they open the lid on the pot on the stove and they discover a human head. And they will later learn that that's Lisa Guy's head cooking. Still simmering. The stove was still on. So, uh, Peck and McCord and the other officers there, they realize this is a monstrous crime, okay? They're feeling some sense of urgency now to figure out who did this. And, uh, and they have to take steps to figure out how, uh, you know, how in the world, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to solve this? So they do what investigators do, and they interview people. They do a neighborhood canvas. They talk to people in the neighborhood to try to figure out when the guys were last seen, who may have been at the house, they notify next of kin. They discover from Michelle Dennison that she was just there, uh, that she was there on Thanksgiving, um, that her half-brother, Joel Jr., Joel Michael, they call him, was there. Uh, uh, he gets a description of vehicles. He uh, gets, uh, he, he really, he gets on that receipt from Walmart. And when he goes to Walmart to uh, check this out, he's able to talk to someone there who uh, is kind enough to cooperate. And they give him uh, video. They, they, you know, they maintain security footage at the stores uh, because of shoplifters and, uh, and, uh, and for business purposes. And so Detective McCord is able to that day, that very day, the 28th, get, uh, get a get a video image and a still shot of, uh, of uh, the person who made that purchase. And he is able to have that person who's depicted in that image identified as Joel and Lisa's only son, Joel Michael Guy, the defendant. And uh, they get an arrest warrant based upon this information and other information. Uh, one of the things that uh, greatly concerned them is that in this image that they saw at Walmart, the defendant is uh, his, his hand is bandaged, okay, and he's buying medical supplies, and he's not there 
and they've received information that he has, has gone back to Louisiana, back to Baton Rouge on November the 27th. And so based upon that and other evidence, they, uh, they get an arrest warrant and uh, they enlist the assistance of law enforcement officers from the Louisiana State Police, the FBI, and the East Baton Rouge Sheriff's Office. And uh, all of these agencies work together and uh, the defendant is arrested, I believe, on November the 29th of 2016. And you will hear uh, testimony from people who saw him there who will tell you that his hands were sliced. He had a couple of cut marks on his hands. So uh, you will hear that uh, all of the evidence in this case we submit to you points to the defendant as the killer of his parents. And one of the things that we consider in, uh, in this calculation is, uh, you know, the times of death. The medical examiner and Dr. Mark, the forensic anthropologist, can't tell you how long uh, Joel and Lisa were, uh, were in those, how long their body parts were liquefying in those tubs. They, they, can't, make, they can't make that determination. But uh, we do know certain things. We know from uh, receipts found in Lisa's belongings where she was on November the 26th and that she was alive at some point. And we know that uh, from a receipt found in her purse at the scene that she was at this Walmart in Turkey Creek um, at 1218 in the afternoon, making the purchases uh, of the items that were found in the foyer, okay? The receipt, uh, they were able to, to match up the items listed on the receipt with things that were in the foyer floor. We know that before that, she had gone to PetSmart in Turkey Creek in the same little shopping center to get, uh, you know, to get dog food for her dog. And this is, uh, this is a map, an aerial map. Not up, you'll see. Right up there in that corner, that's Golden View Lane, that little red circle. That's how close they live to, this is the Turkey Creek Shopping Center. There is, uh, here's the PetSmart, and here is the Walmart. So as you can see, she's, she's not that far from the shopping center. She didn't live that far. And I don't know what the traffic was like on, on, that, uh, on that date, but, uh, we can assume that at some point she, she made it home. And we know she made it home because her car was found in the driveway and uh, the groceries were in the foyer. And uh, you will hear from uh, her daughters that uh, that's not usually how Lisa got into the house. Usually she would come through the garage that they sort of used as a sitting room. They were smokers, so they smoked in their garage. And uh, her typical way of getting into the house would be through the garage door and into the, uh, and into the kitchen. That's sort of the logical way most of us get, you know, carry our groceries in closest to uh, the area where we're gonna put them away. But uh, she didn't use the garage entry that day. So um, we know she got home. We know that her purse was found in the kitchen, her keys, her cell phone was on the kitchen counter. She made it home. So we believe the state will prove that she was murdered between that time that it took her to get home, maybe 12.30 p.m. on the 26th, and before 3.35 p.m. because State will prove to you And here he is, leaving the store, and you will note this bandage on his hand. 
here's a close up of him uh, getting a uh, self checkout, getting his medical supplies for this for his wounds. So um, now we know he went back to the house, right? We know he went back to the house because uh, the things that he purchased at Walmart around 3.35 are on the bathroom counter. And I want you to look at these. So uh, here's the receipt again. And here's the bag that the receipt was in. Here's a knife. DNA is on part of that knife. There's some hydrogen peroxide. There's some bandages that were uh, recovered. There's some alcohol, rubbing alcohol, this dermaplast, something like that, some kind of first aid spray. And then all of these gloves. This is Joel Sr.'s cell phone. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Kim Lowe. <laughs> special agent with the TBI that uh, the defendant's DNA is found on six of those gloves inside and out. So Joel and Lisa Guy were dead by 3.35 p.m. And we believe the uh, proof will show that after the defendant tended his injuries, he went to work on their bodies and uh, did what he did to them. The forensic anthropologist has a nice name for what he did. It's called disarticulation. That's an elegant name for uh, cutting off, cutting off their arms and legs and Lisa's head. So, um, planned in advance. He premeditated. He made, uh, after the exercise of reflection and judgment, made the decision to uh, murder his parents. So uh, in the guest bedroom, where you will hear, Michelle Dennison will tell you that that's where the defendant was staying on Thanksgiving. Uh, you're going to see that there's a backpack found in the corner of the room. And it was taken into evidence and later inventoried per the policy of the sheriff's office. That's what they have to do when they seize evidence, something like that. They inventory the contents of it. And uh, here it is. And uh, they opened it, of course, and they found instruction manual for residential hot water heater. And they found some books and they found a notebook. And in the notebook, there was a, a writing. And I want to go through it with you a little bit, because uh, it's kind of hard to see like this. But we'll start from the first line. Get killing knives. Quiet. Multiple. Get carving knives to make small pieces. Get sledgehammer, crush bones. And of course, there were multiple knives found at the scene. You will hear uh, there was a knife in the guest bathroom, a knife in the sink in the master bathroom. There were two knives next to uh, the pile of bloody clothes that belonged to Joel Guy in the exercise room. And then there was a bloody knife next to Lisa Guy's uh, cut up clothing. There is no evidence that uh, he used the knives to make small pieces other than the hands and head. Or that he used the sledgehammer to crush bones. You will not hear evidence of that. Bring blender and food grinder. Grind meat. Well, we will not show you that he did grind any meat, but we will show you that he brought a blender and that in his vehicle that was searched after his arrest in Baton Rouge, he did have a food processor in the trunk.
get bleach denature proteins. Well, there was bleach, several tubs of bleach in the kitchen. Get plastic bin for denaturation process. And uh, I guess that's, uh, that means for dissolving uh, your parents. Does not matter where they're killed. Just get rid of bloody spots to prevent evidence of time of death not the mattress or couches. Get rid of bodies inside the house, there and my DNA already there. Because of course he had been visiting, so his DNA would be in the house necessarily. I, I guess that's what that means. Um, he needs to be, I can't read that word, not intruder. Flush chunks down toilet, not garbage disposal. No evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, that he did that. Uh, but the next line, get plastic sheeting for disposal process. There is evidence that there was plastic sheeting at the scene on the bed uh, where Joel and Lisa guys slept. Get hollow point bullets just in case. We'll be seen buying bullets. Just use computer room gun. Check to make sure there are bullets, last resort. There were no gunshot wounds to the victims. He's not alive to claim her half of the insurance money, all mine, $500,000. You will hear evidence through Jennifer Whited and through documents from Jacob Engineering that Lisa Guy did have an insurance policy. Uh, she was going to be employed until uh, the following Friday uh, after her after Thanksgiving and uh, you will see that he was a beneficiary in fact to this life insurance policy flood the house covers up forensic evidence no evidence that he flooded the house turn heater up as high as it goes speeds comp decomposition again uh, Thermostats were in the 90s, both upstairs and downstairs. Bleach reacts with luminol, just like blood. Douse area with bleach. Big sprayer. There was a big sprayer in a box on the kitchen floor. I don't know that it had been opened, and I can't tell you that the state will prove that there was evidence that he doused the area with bleach. Uh, but there was lye, and... Uh, he mentioned, it says trash compactor, question mark. The next line is body gives time of death, alibi. Don't have to get rid of body if there's no forensic evidence on the body. His fingerprints and DNA. And that brings us to the severed hands. Um, the severed hands. We believe the state will prove to you that uh, the hands were severed for a purpose, okay? For a purpose. There's a reason behind it. Minimize, and we're on to the second page of the notebook. Minimize things I touch throughout the visit. Wear gloves and socks to pre prevent fingerprints and footprints. And as I said, you will see uh, photographic evidence that there were gloves, latex gloves, found throughout the house, boxes of them, uh, in his bedroom, in the bedroom that he was using in the house, in the master bedroom, in the kitchen, um, in the guest bath. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground, or get him on the ground fixing it. Kill him with the knife. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Kill her with knife. Kill the dog after. And that's marked out and above it. Leave him alive. Fingerprints. Take dog with you. I don't know what this says. First word I don't understand. Him with him is all I can read. The next line is place her in shower. Turn on hot water and point at her to get rid of forensics. Remove her clothes and take them with me for disposal. And 
you know her clothes were removed. Well, in the upstairs bathroom and plant his Lisa guys in a you You'll hear evidence. Other wash out bin. House, killing rooms, kitchen, question mark, with bleach. Place hair curler with flammable paper and flammable containers of gasoline in four locations. His killing room, her killing room, his bed. And bathroom. late Sunday to prove that I was in Baton Rouge and she was, in quotation marks, alive. Leave through front door and wipe down doorknobs. Timer for flammables set for Friday at 10 a.m. Sunlight masks fire but not smoke. Everyone at work, so they can't report it. This is an enlargement of uh, what is on this page. Ultraviolet light shows fingerprints. Check mail before leaving. To get rid of blood, use peroxide hemoglobin and bleach DNA. Destruction of bodies. Composition of body, 20% fat, 20% protein, 55% water, and 5% other components. Assets. These pages will show you that the defendant analyzed the financial assets of uh, his parents. Her assets, her life insurance, 500000 possibly more with double indemnity. With him missing dead, I get the whole thing. All her other assets are joint. Go to him if missing, unknown if he's dead. His assets includes all joint property if missing. When he gets all joint property, also gets joint debt. Knoxville House, homeowner's insurance, possibly, but probably worthless after the fire, oh, $100,000. Sir Goinsville House, appraised at 400000 plus, worthless with Renee on the property. You will hear testimony that Renee Charles is Joel Guy Sr.'s sister. His sisters live in the Sir Goinsville area. Her car, his SUV, not paid for. His boat, his old truck, paid for. His 401k, $80,000, possibly less after taxes. He could possibly have savings and or other investment accounts. So we believe that the proof will show you, ladies and gentlemen, that the motive in this case, it's not an element of the crime, but the motive is financial money, all mine, $500,000. I get the whole thing. 
there are two counts of, uh, well, three counts actually of uh, felony murder uh, involving theft, the theft of property, and we expect to provide uh, testimony that certain financial transactions were made with the guy's assets after the time of their deaths on uh, November the 27th. And uh, other articles of theirs were taken, uh, and we believe that proof will show uh, just what was taken from them. You're going to hear from expert witnesses, as I alluded to, or as I said in uh, earlier. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, a DNA expert who will talk to you about the DNA evidence found throughout the house. Uh, you know, uh, she's going to tell you exactly where uh, she found the defendant's DNA, certainly on the latex gloves, on some of the weapons, and uh, of course uh, the DNA of Joel and Lisa Guy were found throughout the house and uh, on a lot of the blood evidence. Not all DNA evidence is blood evidence, of course. And she will explain all of this to you. That's Agent Kim Lowe. Then you will hear uh, about the autopsy of Joel Sr. And the autopsy for Lisa. Dr. Amy Hawes with the Forensic Center in Knox County is our expert witness in that area. And she will uh, testify to you about the cause and manner of death and uh, you will uh, see photographic evidence and uh, you'll see diagrams and she will be able to better explain to you uh, than, than me uh, what exactly happened to them. And again, you're gonna hear from uh, a forensic anthropologist, uh, Dr. Marie Marks, with respect to uh, the injuries to the uh, bones of both Joel uh, and Lisa, Joel was identified by fingerprints because we had his hands, and Lisa was identified by uh, dental records. And Dr. Marks will describe for you and show you uh, images of the uh, damage that was done to, uh, to, to their bone structures and explain the difference between dismemberment and disarticulation, and uh, he's, uh, he will... Uh, he will be one of our, our expert witnesses. You will also hear expert testimony on, uh, with respect to fingerprints and uh, electronic uh, uh, devices that were examined by uh, uh, Eddie Wassman with the uh, Sheriff's Office and Tom Finch, who did the fingerprint evidence. So uh, other than the felony murder counts, the premeditated murder counts, the felony murder counts, uh, Mr. Guy is also charged with two counts of abuse of corpse. Um, you know, I don't think we need to belabor that. And you will hear evidence of flight, and the court will give you an instruction on what uh, flight means and how you can judge it uh, uh, with respect to uh, the uh, with respect to this case, but the evidence we submit to you will show that after killing his parents and uh, dismembering them and uh, trying to destroy evidence of his involvement at this scene, he left, went back to Louisiana. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that at the uh, end of our proof, at the conclusion of everything, turn it off, you will find Joel Michael Guy Jr. guilty of every count of this indictment because we will have proven it to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, General Nassius. Mr. Halstead, would you like to make an opening statement, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Just very I first just wanted to introduce myself. Mr. Streamans did all the work in the jury selection. I am John Halstead. This is Mark Stevens, and we are representing today Mr. Guy. I want to start out by saying thank you for being here. Our criminal justice system is one of the, probably the best one in the world. And what makes it so great is that we have citizens who are willing to come to court, especially during a pandemic, during a time like this, willing to come to court spend a week listening to the proof and making a decision. 
And another strong part of our constitutional criminal process is that that decision has to be made beyond a reasonable doubt. And that reasonable doubt can come from witnesses, it can come from physical evidence, it can come from cross-examination. And we just ask you and know that you will listen to everything very closely, listening for the reasonable doubt and making your decision at the end of the case. Again, I want to thank you for being here. This is a difficult time to try a case, difficult time to do anything, and we really need you and you've come forward and we really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, folks, so we are going to take a recess. We're going to rearrange the courtroom to set up the witness stand uh, for the witnesses. And uh, this will take us a little bit of time, but we should be able to start the proof before lunch. I suspect this is probably going to be a 20 to 30 minute break. Uh, once again, do not discuss this case among yourselves. Uh, you can leave your notebooks in your chairs if you'd like. Uh, also, if you want to leave personal belongings in the jury room, it'll be locked unless you folks are in there. So feel free to leave your belongings back there if you'd like. At this time, I'd ask you to go with the officers. We're going to start from the front again, and we'll just empty the jury box first, and then the back rows.